Okay, so uh, in the last uh, you know short uh, lecture segment, we talked about um, the Vicek model, uh, which was you know a canonical uh, active matter model, uh, and we thought about the difference between uh, taking exactly the same set of update rules, you know, move the positions according to the self-propulsion in some direction, and update the direction according to the average direction of the neighbors of some particle plus some noise, you know, exactly the same sets of update rules, and then just um, uh, varying what we meant by choose your set of neighbors, right? And I thought it might be helpful just to kind of see uh, like a visualization of uh, some of the distinctions we're talking about. <clears throat> so, uh, so I just went ahead and wrote a few quick scripts to uh, just kind of uh, construct these different types of neighbor lists and visualize them in like a simple way. Uh, so for instance, um, let's just uh, see what it looks like if we take, you know, a uh, hundred uh, particles and just throw them in a box with periodic boundary conditions. And, uh, and construct neighbor lists in one of two uh, different ways, right? So in this first way, I'm doing, you know, a very standard, hey, any particle that's within, you know, some specific distance, and here I've chosen um, something like a tenth of the length of the box in each dimension, um, you know, if two particles are within some fixed metric distance, then count them as neighbors of each other. And so I'm illustrating that by, you know, drawing edges between them. And these, uh, these light gray lines are um, if the particles are neighbors across the periodic boundary conditions of the box, right? So we can kind of quickly generate, um, you know, different configurations here. We can say what happens if we, you know, on average make the interaction radius less, uh, you know, what happens if we increase it? Um, you get these much more dense uh, connected graphs, of course. Um, kind of, kind of makes sense, right? In contrast, what if we take, you know, let's say exactly the same set of uh, points, and you can see here I'm just randomly, uniformly throwing them down in the box, um, and generating a neighbor list not based on this kind of metric criteria, but based on, in this case, um, constructing a Delaunay triangulation or equivalently a Voronoi tessellation. Um, and you can see the character of the neighbor list is very different. You know, first, uh, in this setting, there's a well-defined average number of neighbors that you will always get just based on um, topological considerations. And also, you know, the um, distances between neighbors uh, is much broader now. You can have some neighbors that are very close to each other, some neighbors that are very far, uh, so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, let's, uh, let's remember that the fundamental molecular dynamics loop, like let's say we're thinking about this kind of V-check model, um, uh, you know, exactly this set of update rules, you know, the only difference in choosing um, topological versus metric interactions really comes down to how do I select my sets of neighbors? And so, you know, we can kind of script this up in a code which abstracts away all of the common features of this model and leaves us free to define, you know, metric versus topological um, interaction rules uh, as, as we like. So I also uh, went ahead and uh, and did that. And in your homework, I'm going to encourage you to do uh, exactly the same thing. Not exactly the same thing, but this like style of work. Where you can see what I'm doing is, you know, first just defining a handful of parameters. And then, you know, initializing the system so that um, in this VCheck model in two dimensions for convenience, um, you know, initially the points are just randomly distributed uh, in a box. Uh, and the directors, these n hats, are just uh, pointing in uniformly random directions in the plane. I'm going to choose parameters of my model, like what's the time step, what's the self-propulsion. I'm going to ask, you know, I'm going to set how long I want to run this uh, simulation for. And then I'm just going to do a loop that says, you know, at each time step, um, update the positions, you know, according to, you know, this kind of uh, update rule, and then 
you know, just like I said uh, up here for all time steps, then, you know, find the neighbors and update whatever needs updating based on those neighbors. Um, sorry. So we have a update positions, we have a find our neighbors. And in this case, I'm going to just find neighbors uh, in a metric way. So anything, any two particles that are within, again, this like one tenth tenth of the box diameter, I'm going to say box length, I'm going to say our neighbors. Um, and then I'm going to update the uh, directors, the directions that these uh, agents are pointing in um, based on this update rule given this set of neighbors, right? And then I'm going to record positions so that I can kind of show them later. <clears throat> and you can see that, you know, when we've kind of set up, uh, when we've set up our abstractions in this way, the only difference between a metrically interacting uh, VCheck model and a topologically interacting VCheck model can entirely be in this, well, how do you choose your sets of neighbors? But otherwise, the update rules for both the positions and the directions can be exactly the same. So you can see here I'm just separately calling either a neighbor list generating function which constructs neighbor lists based on a Voronoi or Delaunay construction, uh, or one that uh, chooses neighbors based on um, based on a metric consideration. And um, I renamed the function so that instead of simple neighbor list, it was get neighbor list cell 2D. Here I'm using a uh, grid-based cell list uh, accelerator so that it's a little bit faster. And I thought it would be, uh, you know, potentially interesting just to kind of, you know, visualize what uh, these two different flocking models kind of look like. So here, you know, I ran each of these metric and topological models for, uh, you know, a few hundred particles for a few hundred time steps. You know, here's the uh, initial configuration in the... Uh, the initial configuration of the points. Uh, you can see this is the metric model, and you know you have uh, in this case blue instead of black lines uh, showing what's a neighbor of what, and these little red lines are showing what direction um, is associated with each degree of freedom um, at the instant that I'm recording this frame. <clears throat> and you can see that the you know time evolution of this thing um, here I've chosen a relatively no low noise uh, setting so that you quickly get to a flocking state where there's real density in homogeneities in this model or in this flocking state you know the um, you have these like dense flocks where one of the characteristics of this uh, state is to have um, very unusual uh, so-called giant number fluctuations uh, if you look at different points of space um, separated by you know extremely low density regions uh, in contrast, if we look at exactly, if we look at exactly the same model and the same evolution equations, but just using you know a Delaunay construction, a topological construction rather than a metric construction, um, you have a flocking state which you know uh, shares some similarities with the flocking state uh, in the previous section, but also you know has some different characters to it. There are still some um, density fluctuations here, but the magnitude of the giant number fluctuations in the state, even deep in the flocking state that we're looking at here, are of a very different character than, than what you would get in the, um, in the metric version of this model. Uh, and so again, part of the homework is going to involve just kind of exploring uh, on your own uh, some of these uh, characteristic differences in these models. That's great. Uh, the last thing that I want to uh, very briefly discuss here um, is uh, just like a second case study, a second case study, um, which is the so-called Voronoi model of dense tissue. Uh, and I just wanted to go through this so that you, you know, just have a sense that it's not just in these like flocking models that the idea of using a topological neighbor list is relevant. Actually, I think uh, there's a lot of kind of interesting soft or living matter systems where this where this will come up. Right? So in the case of you know birds, we basically argued that there was experimental data 
that suggested that birds choose to align with neighbors, where neighbors was something that was defined not based on a distance threshold, but based on some other more topological criteria. These models of dense tissue, um, these models of dense tissue are motivated from a little bit of a different, uh, different place. Really, the idea here is you have cells that are completely filling space, and their interactions are really are determined just by, well, what other cells share like edges, share cell wall, uh, um, share cell wall, wall contacts uh, with other cells, right? So a, a way of um, modeling these kinds of tissues is to kind of imagine uh, taking videos like, like this. Uh, actually, that is the wrong one is to take videos uh, like this um, a little bit too seriously and imagining as we look at this, again, cross-sectional view through a monolayer of cells, to imagine that what we're seeing is really like a collection of interacting shapes uh, that completely fill up the plane. Uh, or you can imagine a three-dimensional generalization of that uh, completely filling up space. Right? So we like imagine uh, we imagine a model of interacting, interacting geometrical units. Right, like for instance, shapes filling the plane. And in that context, you might imagine saying, okay, my fundamental molecular dynamics algorithm says I should, well, let's say choose a set of degrees of freedom that I'll be considering, initialize the system in that way, and then figure out how to write down interactions that I think might be appropriate. So here, uh, for the initialization step, or really even just the choice of degrees of freedom, we might imagine doing something like saying, uh, let's take, uh, take a Voronoi uh, tessellation and have each generating point have each generating point be a degree of freedom. Okay. So the idea here is that if I throw down points uh, in my simulation box and then I take a Voronoi tessellation, that will give me a space-filling set of uh, shapes that um, you know that I can consider uh, as my my interacting cells. Right. Um, a common energy functional uh, that people that people have taken is to say, you know, if I really am imagining uh, and now. Uh, Let's just uh, let's just take the Voronoi tessellation. Um, you know, if I'm really imagining like this Voronoi region represents a cell uh, corresponding to a positional degree of freedom represented by this uh, point, right? So if I moved this point a little bit, it would you know change the Voronoi diagram. So a common energy functional that people take to uh, describe these systems are things like, well, let's imagine taking a low order Taylor expansion in some of the relevant geometric parameters that we could write down. So for instance, um, how different is the actual area of each Voronoi region from some target area, for instance, or how different is the actual perimeter of each of those Voronoi regions from some target perimeter. So these uh, a naughts and p naughts, these are like model parameters, and you can argue about biologically where they might come from, or you can take a very kind of physics-y perspective and say, we're writing down a geometrical model, let's just take a low order expansion in geometrical uh, parameters. In some ways, I'll comment, um, it's like a generalization, generalization of a model of foams of foams. Um, 
it's a generalization of a model of foams. Uh, but then given this energy, you could say, well, I'll take the forces on you know, one of my degrees of freedom to be given by you know, negative gradients of, um, of this energy. Now, this is going to be a complex, many-body set of forces because, of course, you know, here I've written the energies in terms of the areas and the perimeters of each cell. But really, you know, each area, you know, say the area of, um, let's say the area of cell I is really a quite complex function of, you know, the position of cell I and the set of positions of all of the, you know, nearby points, right? Because together this determines, um, you know, what is the region of space closer to cell I than to any other cell? And similarly, you know, the perimeter is also a complex function of all of these things. So actually evaluating this gradient to get the forces acting on each of my degrees of freedom is a little bit of a annoying mathematical exercise. If you're really interested, um, I've put some of the relevant details in the appendix. Um, but you can see how this fits into the same framework that we were uh, thinking about before, right? So we have uh, we have a system, you know. We have uh, we let's say initialize a system. Here it's the positions of a bunch of generating points for a Voronoi diagram, Voronoi diagram, and then we can say you know four time steps. Uh, we can do something like uh, compute. Voronoi neighbors, evaluate forces based on this topological version of a neighbor list. And now we're using this kind of topological neighbor list because it's baked into the structure of the problem we've set up for ourselves. Um, and then we can update, you know, the positions. And here, you know, I've left this very general. So this, again, could be, you know, self-propelled particle dynamics. It could be Brownian or Langevin dynamics. We could be doing, you know, Nose Hoover thermostatting in an NVT ensemble in a purely equilibrium context. Like, it can be quite general. Right? And there, there are some issues of uh, computational complexity here and kind of marrying these topological evaluations of neighbor lists or topological evaluations of, uh, you know, things like constructing Voronoi diagrams so that you can even define, in this case, the geometrical um, features that go into your model. Um, there are some issues involved with making that, um, you know, efficient and easily parallelized. That's something that I happen to enjoy thinking about. Um, but so you can, you can, uh, but in any event, you can imagine, you know, taking uh, exactly what I've just outlined and, uh, and using it to run any number of any of the entire class of molecular dynamics like simulations to study different, you know, aspects of this model numerically. Right? And so here, I don't know, I just made some video kind of, I don't know, showing something cute. So you can see uh, at the beginning, we've got the zoom in, we have shapes interacting with each other according to the energy functional I wrote down earlier. Um, in this case, I believe this is a model of uh, simple self-propelled particles, kind of like active Brownian particles. Um, and then, you know, I've taken the time to, you know, implement these kind of simulations, not just in Mathematica, which, you know, it's easy to script things up in, but uh, like all scripting languages tends to be pretty inefficient. Um, but really, you know, in a performant um, GPU accelerated way so that we can study things like um, the behavior of this model close to critical points at long length and time scales and, and so on and so forth. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed um, uh, this little rapid fire tour through thinking about, you know, some interesting um, physical phenomena that can result by, you know, kind of generalizing the way we think about, um, 
implementing the algorithms uh, that we build to run our simulations, right? Uh, in this case, the idea of generalizing a neighbor list so that it's not strictly metric, uh, but maybe involves other perhaps topological considerations, leads you to models that um, can really lie in different universality classes and can even, you know, especially in the case of things like Kane nearest neighbors, where suddenly you're breaking, you know, Newton's third law in having these non-reciprocal interactions, can really let you explore some of the like deep new physics that arises when you consider out of equilibrium systems or systems that are interacting with each other not according to conservative forces, but maybe the kind of effective forces that will become more and more important to think about as we move towards, you know, understanding the collective behavior of organisms um, with complicated, you know, neural networks uh, behind them.